So let's welcome Chef. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I'm excited about our time together today, and I appreciate you being here uh, bright and early. I hope uh, your first few moments of November have started well. I can't believe that uh, October is, is already behind us. Uh, that seems crazy to me. It seemed like the other day I was excited about summer. Now summer's gone. I was excited about fall, and fall has arrived. Uh, I'm get a little read of the room this morning. How many of you are UT uh, sports fans? You like sports and you like UT. Very good. That's as far as I'm going with that. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask any other questions related to that. In case some of you might be fans of other teams, you're very welcome. Also, but uh, I always like to. Uh, when I drive this way, I, I, I think about the beautiful mountains, and that gets me thinking about. Uh, all that we have to be appreciative for living in this region. I've lived in this region my entire life. Grew up in Oak Ridge. Uh, of course, live in Hardin Valley now. And if you've been in Hardin Valley lately, uh, likely you were in some traffic uh, because there's quite a few people who seem to have made Hardin Valley either home or working there. So uh, we're all navigating this newfound amount of traffic that we have. But it's great to be with you. Our topic today, of course, is conflict and dealing with conflict. And I'm excited about digging into that. And if time allows, uh, we'll cover some other topics that might be on top of mind for you in addition to conflict. But let's get into it and we'll, uh, we'll set the stage a little bit. Some of the things you can expect, um, we're going to look at uh, a definition for conflict and, uh, you know, have some fun talking about exactly what that looks like. Now, I'm very practical. Uh, I work with people every day um, in professional roles. I have the privilege, as Melissa shared, to partner with people very closely as their executive coach, and that's a very customized engagement, um, and also provide training such as this. And I, I, I want to be very practical with you this morning, okay? And I, and I hope you will participate in this. I'd much rather this be a discussion than a lecture. So, um, Share your perspectives on conflict or challenging situations, and we will all work through those together. We're going to look at two types of conflict, some conflict management strategies, uh, at least the five, five of those. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, the five modes of Thomas Kilman, those conflict management strategies. Uh, we'll look at those. De-escalating and navigating conflict, and then finally, if we have time, We'll end up uh, with a couple of leadership nuggets and just enjoy uh, some discussion. And I'll leave you with a bit of a challenge today. Wouldn't be a good coach if I didn't leave you with a challenge. So we'll conclude with that. How I would like this session to go. Um, if you don't want to say a word, relax. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Be at ease. It's not my MO to put people on the spot in these, these sort of gatherings. But if you'd like to be part of the conversation, uh, I would welcome it. Please share your perspectives, uh, make this set, uh, session just even more engaging for everybody. Ask questions. Word about reflection and application. I think a good training session should cause us to reflect. And that reflection may sound like, huh, how am I doing in that area? Hmm. How does that apply to me? Uh, I think reflection is powerful. I must say that throughout my career, I've not been a great reflector. The, really, the essence of reflection is taking a beat, pausing. And in the, since pa the pandemic, more and more of my clients have begun to use reflection in a pretty powerful way. Uh, I have a client um, who said, Hey, Chuck, I am so struggling to disconnect from work when the work day's over. It's like I spend my evenings running through my head what I want to do tomorrow, um, and I'm not as fully present with those that I love the most uh, when the work day's over. And we started thinking about, hey, how can we do this, and what might reflection look like for this person? And we came up with three simple questions, and I'm just going to share those with you today because you might find yourself in the same situation. Hey, it is hard to disconnect. These three questions are so simple the first question uh, this leader asks themselves at the end of every day, this is their closeout process every day. Okay, so I think, 
I think a best practice is having a startup process when we get to work. I'm going to step back one step and say, I think an, perhaps an even better practice is having a first hour of the day practice that's for us. Now, if you have young kids, that doesn't apply to you, okay? <laughs> because you're in a season where your first hour of the day is very uh, irregular probably and, and heavily dependent on what your little one's doing. But uh, Robin Sharma wrote a great book, The 5 a.m. Club. Don't get hung up on, on the 5 a.m. part. Um, there is a 5 in the morning also for some of you if, you. if you like to sleep a little later, you're here this morning, so it's probably not you. But Sharma's perspective is, hey, if you, you win the day by winning the morning. And he laid out, hey, take that first hour of the day and make it what you want it to be. What's most important to you? Do you want to learn? Do you want to exercise? Do you want to, do you want to uh, participate in, you know, have a faith practice? What do you want to do your first hour of the day to start your day? You win the morning, you win the day. Okay, I digress for a second. Those three questions that, that uh, this leader began to ask at the end of each day, their closeout, number one was, what went well today? What went well today? And, and then they answer that question. They think about, what went well today? Oh, that, that meeting this morning went really well. Then they've taken that to the next step and they ask, okay, what made it go well? And see, the essence of reflection is, is really maximizing what we've experienced or learned. So we're all learning every day. We all have experiences every day. So often, I think we have those and we go through them and on to the next thing and we don't take a beat to say, hey, what's the lesson in that for me? What can I learn from that? What made that meeting go well? So if my client, for instance, said, hey, that meeting went well this morning. Now they'll ask themselves, why did it go well? And he might come up with an answer like, well, you know, I, I got the agenda out a little bit further in advance than I normally do. And I, I thought I was really well prepared, and so I was more at ease. And I did a better job of engaging other people in the meeting. So they're taking, why did that meeting go well? Their first question uh, at the end of each day is, what went well today? Their second question is, what didn't go well today? What didn't go as well as we'd want it to? And it, as an example, they might say, wow, I had a really unpleasant conversation with uh, so-and-so on our team. I didn't see it going that way. Uh, they came in and told me, you know, hey, they, they kind of felt underappreciated. And to be honest, I took offense to that. And so it really, instead of listening, I started explaining to them how they were wrong. And I recognized that didn't go well. And that was, that was why. First question, what went well today? Second question, what didn't go well today? This is the one that has helped them decompress, separate work from after work. And the th simple question is, and what are my th top three priorities tomorrow? So they leave work having identified, hey, what are my big three tomorrow? And they jot those down on a post-it note. Now, some of my clients who have started reflecting, they're using a journal. And they're keeping that every day. Some are doing it uh, electronically because that's just more comfortable to them. I think there's something powerful about writing it down or, or uh, uh, typing it out. I think there's something powerful about asking those three questions. How long does this take? When it started, it was about a 15-minute shutdown. It's a five-minute shutdown for my client. Now they've been doing it a while. It's a rhythm. It's a routine. And they tell me, hey, I've never experienced being more present in the evening because I've already asked myself, what are my big three tomorrow? I'm not trying to remember what I need to do tomorrow. I've already written that down. I'm trying to be more present in the evening. So I offer that just as a little bonus uh, material this morning as we get ready to discuss uh, conflict. That was just uh, when I saw reflection. Uh, the, the application piece, I think a good training causes us to to reflect and a great training gives us something we can use as early as this afternoon. And I'm hoping this will be a great training for you. So let me ask you a question before we define conflict. Fill in the rest of this statement for me. Use one word. Conflict is 
blank. What's your word to go in the blank? Conflict is, what's your word? Friction, stressful, messy, messy uncomfortable. uncomfortable, unavoidable. Anything else? An opportunity. An opportunity. And I think if we pause for a minute, we'd say, man, those are great answers, and they're all true. It's an opportunity. It's friction. It's messy. It's unavoidable. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. And I think it's all of that. You know, as, as, um, as I've been thinking through this, this time with you this morning, uh, conflict is one of those things that I have observed that it takes a certain number of reps to get more proficient at navigating. And we're going to look at the, the, some of the theoretical and we're going to get some practical steps. But I want to encourage you. If you say, hey Chuck, I really find conflict difficult. You're in great company. Most leaders I work with do. Okay? I, in fact, I would be a bit concerned if somebody said, man, today's going to be a great day. I'm going to have a very difficult conversation with somebody. It's going to be awesome. Like Most of us don't think that way. We, have a, we know we're going to have a difficult conversation we might wake up a little bit earlier. Our palms might be a little bit sweaty. Our mouth might be dry. It's like, hey, I'm not looking forward to this. But you get better at it. I don't know if you ever get totally, totally comfortable, depending on how messy the situation is, how difficult it is. But I do think we can get better at it. And that's what I hope today's about. So some uh, more formal definitions. The uh, Webster's gives the synonyms for conflict as a fight, battle, or war. Some of, their def some of Webster's definitions would be a competitive or opposing action of incompatibles. <laughs> Antagonistic state or action, as in divergent ideas, interests, or persons. Now, that's work some days. That's leadership some days. A mental struggle resulting from incompatible or opposing needs, drives, wishes, or external or internal demands. And that sounds like work or leadership as well. To be different, opposed, or contradictory. To fail to be in agreement or accord. That's conflict. So I want us to make sure we're all thinking the same thing. When, when we're thinking conflict, it could be very much competitive or opposing actions. And it could feel antagonistic. It, divergent ideas, different interests, different motivations, different personality styles, mental struggle, opposing needs, drives, wishes. This is conflict. Now, how do we deal with it? I'm curious, what are some common examples of conflict in the workplace? Things you've experienced. Personalities. Personality differences. You bet. Strategic. Strategic differences. Absolutely. Work ethic. Work ethic differences. That leads to a frustration that creates a conflict. Yep. Cultural differences, culture in the workplace and individual cultures that, hey, we, we come from different cultures and now we're melding and meshing into one. And we're called a team, but teams have a interdependency and teams uh, are to work together and, hey, like, I don't fully understand this person, much less get how they work. I'm not even fully tracking their language. You know, there's just times we are disconnected and seem to be at odds. What else? Definition of success. Yeah, because our view of success can be very different. In fact, if we took time this morning, went around the room, I gave you an index card and said, hey, write down your definition of success. We'd have several different ones, like a lot of different ones. And, hey, I'd just encourage you for a minute. If you don't have your own definition of success... Take it between now and the end of the year, come up with that. Because 
I think you're all, y'all, er, we all got up this morning hoping to be successful. We didn't get up this morning with the intent to be unsuccessful or fail. And sometimes we're not perhaps as crystal clear of what that target is. So there's success. Hey, we got to hit this metric. You know, our, this is our quarter results. This is what we did in October. And we might define that as success, but we also have the privilege to write our own, have our own definition of success and what that means to each of us. That's good. So all those things you've mentioned, we're in the right place. Now, I want us to dig into why those things occur, those differences, those incompatibilities, those, those, some of those challenges, and how are we going to deal with those in the workplace. So let's look at dealing with conflict. I want us to look at two different ways. One, we're directly involved in the conflict. In other words, it's us and someone else. Or maybe our team and that team. But we're in it. Regardless of our role, we're a part of the conflict. And I'm going to make an assumption that all of us at some point in our work journey have felt that being at odds or we recognize we're at odds, maybe ideological, different perspectives, different strategies we're advocating, but we're not on this, we're not agreeing. And hey, can there be healthy conflict? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Does conflict have to be unhealthy? Or maybe more personality driven. Okay, I, I just don't like that person. In simple terms, I don't get them. Like they rub me the wrong way every day. Okay. Or we're navigating conflict. We're not in it, but we're around it and often leading in a way that we're trying to bring others, be it two people on your team, be it two colleagues who have now gotten at loggerheads. They're just like, yeah, you know, they're an idiot and they never listen and, you know, I'm done with them. Well, that's really not an option in all probability. Because we don't work in, 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 if we're on a team or we're colleagues, that, that doesn't sound like that's a viable path forward. So we're going to look at, hey, when we're involved and when we're trying to help others navigate or deal with conflict and bring some re resolution. And as team leaders, what might our responsibilities be in navigating conflict? Hey, do I, do I just let it ride and believe it'll work itself out? Is that a viable strategy? How quickly do I jump in? And when I jump in, what do I do? Two types of conflict. Let's talk about procedural conflict. Okay, Procedural conflict is focused on um, differences related to, say, a process. Um, uh, 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 oftentimes you would see this where uh, there are competing interests for resources. Hey, I, I need X resource, be it human or otherwise. And uh, someone else or another team says, we, we need X. And like, hey, I need X. And like, hey, no, no, we need this. And there is a competition, and that competition goes a bit dysfunctional. And the, a conflict arises uh, perhaps from that. So there's... Um, the process of accomplishing a task, and we've gotten in competition that has brought about a conflict over typically a resource. Or it could be an idea. We said a minute ago, hey, strategically, you know, I think we should do this. Let's go in that direction. Or let's launch that. Or let's rethink our strategic plan for the next 12 months. Or, hey, I think we should do this strategically. And there are differing or competing ideas, and those competing ideas can sometimes be handled in a very healthy way, and other times they get a little bit more um, unhealthy. And we see emotion, and we see some of the things we might do when we're frustrated. Hey, you know, I'm going to do some work um, behind the scenes to try to get my idea moved forward a bit. And the other person took that as being a bit uh, underhanded or deceitful. And why did you do that? And now we are in a conflict that started because we both wanted what was best for the organization. 
but we saw it differently. We both wanted success for the organization, but we saw it differently. And then in the concern, my way might not be the chosen way, I did a little bit extra. I did a little bit behind the scenes. I lobbied a little bit. I, I turned, perhaps, perhaps soured, tried to sour a group on the other perspective. And now there's some conflict. Or it could be about roles. So one of the responsibilities a leader has is to clarify expectations and roles. Hey, what are the expectations for this person or role? And what are my authorities or responsibilities within my role? Where does my role begin and end? And what, how far outside, what are my boundaries? And sometimes we see people who don't fully execute their role. And that can be a conflict. Like, hey, do your job. And that frustrates us. And it seems like no one's dealing with it. And when no one's dealing with it, our frustration level might bubble up a bit. And now we might say something. Hey, do your job. Well, you do your job. And now we're, we're having a bit of workplace conflict. Okay? Maybe the root of that was because perhaps my expectations weren't accurate. Or perhaps that person really wasn't fully executing their, their role and they weren't being held accountable to do so. And, you know, let's pull up to 10,000 feet for a minute and say, hey, a lot of this conflict comes from our perceptions. And it's possible my perception is spot on. It's also possible my perception is skewed. I'm looking through my lens at the situation. And it's possible I'm seeing it accurate. It's also possible where I don't have enough data points. Like I'm making a judgment based on a day or a moment or a few moments. And all of that can create a, hey, I, I don't think that person's doing their part. I don't think that person's working very hard. And I start moving down that road and now I'm looking for evidence to support my theory. See, I told you. Which can happen. So this third type really deals with roles. Have we clarified, is it clear who has responsibility or authority to do what? Because sometimes you can have very eager, ambitious go-getters, and they might have a tendency to step over the boundary into somebody else's area of, into their role a bit, because they want to be a part of something, or they want to do something, or perhaps that's just their wiring. Like, hey, you know, I see that opportunity and I'm going for it. And somebody else feels like, hey, that's in my space. That's in my role. That's in my territory. Like, what are you doing? And a conflict ensues. So those are more procedural conflicts. The root of them was procedural. Now, it can, as we know, conflict can start based on a role or a process or a resource, and it can turn more personal the longer it goes. In fact, there's a, this isn't in my slides, but I'll mention it. Um, there's a three-step process where in the early stages of conflict, you know, there's me, there's the other person, and there's the issue. And in the early stages of conflict, I'm concerned about all three. I'm concerned about solving the issue. I'm even initially concerned about, hey, you know, I'm listening to that other person. I'm hearing that other person. I'm not necessarily hoping that other person, you know, it'd be ideal if we could reach a place where, where we could all move forward. There are three parts, me, them, and the issue. Research shows that the longer the conflict goes, my interests begin to change. And in step two, the, my concern for the other person is less. In fact, you could move them out of that equation. My greater concern now is for myself and the issue. I want to come out on top, and I want the issue to be resolved. Conflict arose. I had genuine concern for all three. Me, them, the issue. Conflict keeps going without resolution. Now my concern's less for them. Research says that the longer that conflict goes, 
my concern even gets less about the issue and more about, hey, I'm concerned for me. Now I'm fighting for my rights, my way. I'll think of the name of that in case you want to look it up. It's not in my slides. But the longer the conflict goes, the more self-focused we become. That makes sense to me. Think about it. You know, I get more focused on me, less focused even on the issue, and certainly less focused on the other person. Like, what their needs are, that's really no longer a big deal to me. And even the issue becomes less to me. Now it's about me. Okay, and what I need, what I want. Second type of conflict would be relationship conflict. And this is where we see that personal bias or disagreement. You likely, at this point in our lives, have experienced people who pretty quickly, you just like, yeah, I don't like them a whole lot. Like, I don't get them, or I don't connect with them. I don't understand them. They rub me the wrong way. Uh, I did a, a training using the DISC, D-I-S-C, you're familiar with it, likely. It's a four-quadrant assessment. There are other four-quadrant assessments are, that are also excellent. But DISC would say, hey, the diagonals really have a lot of dissimilarity. They're not that similar in the way they're naturally wired. So like you'd have the D and the S. The D is more of that action-oriented, go-getter, um, usually quick decision maker, often very opinionated. The S is a slower decision maker, uh, very, um, uh, a great teammate typically, um, super supportive, uh, often uh, highly accommodating. Um, the D and the S, like from a wiring standpoint, don't fully get each other and have trouble often in their natural wiring, they're wired very different. D wants to make a decision now, S wants to ponder it a little bit, get some information and in. Let me think about that and, and do the pros and cons. S wants to, they, they want to tell D a story around, hey, this is kind of the background of this. D wants to just know, give me the bottom line. Like, what, what's, the, what's the issue here? They're just wired different. It's not right or wrong. It's just wired different. I's and C's. I's are that prototypical people person. They're outgoing. They're enthusiastic. They're energetic. C's are data-driven. Their greatest value is precision. They love analysis and data. They can do deep work. I's are looking for an interruption. Okay, they like to be interrupted. They want to connect with people. That's the I. Now, all four styles make teams better. There's not a right or wrong, and I work with people in all four styles who are highly effective leaders and accomplished professionals. So there's no style that will say, oh, you know, you're going to be a better leader because you're this or that. My point in bringing it up is there's a natural disconnect in those diagonals. Like from a wiring standpoint, we are wired very different, which makes the effort required to build a connection more. There are people we've met who, from the first minute we met them, it's like we spoke the same language. We related to one another. We liked each other. And other people less so. And the harder it is to build that connection, given our limited time, and in, if the connection isn't necessary, I mean, like, I don't have to have a good connection with that person. I may not invest in doing the work to build a good connection with that person. And over time, that distance gets to be more. And now I may even be more frustrated with them because they did something. Like, I don't like how they interrupt people. I find that very off-putting, disrespectful even. And maybe that's a habit that person has. They didn't interrupt me, but I watched them interrupt somebody else. And I've kind of determined I don't like that person. That's the first one. And you know what? Without putting anybody on the spot, I would say, hey, we've probably all worked with that person. We, or, we, or we've interacted with that person that we found it just difficult to understand them, relate to them, connect with them. It seemed like every conversation was a bit more of a struggle than you would think it would be. In all likelihood, we're wired very different. Not right or wrong. 
and the effort required to build a connection, neither party perhaps saw the need or the interest to put into it. Se second piece, the dispute over what's transpired between the parties in the past. History. Now, some of us have worked, and we have people who have worked for it, with us on our teams. You know, I interact with people regularly less so than I used to. They've been somewhere five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. I was with a group not long ago and at a break, a person walked up to me and said, this is my 42nd year. That's unusual. Okay, uh, You know the history of that. Uh, used to be very common for people to find the, the right fit, do an entire career there, advance if they chose to, and retire with a pension. Okay, Very few pensions anymore, and there's a lot of movement in the workplace. But in some cases, there's history. We have history with someone. We had a bad interaction. We were on opposing sides. We didn't get along about something else. Maybe we used to work together. We worked together on a project. Whatever, we have history. Okay? Third piece is a perception, a perception related to inequity. You know, when we were kids uh, w at school, we, would, we might say about someone they're the teacher's pet. And unless you were the pet, you didn't particularly care for that. If you were the pet, it was a good system. Let's keep it. But if you weren't the pet, you probably thought, that's not fair. Well, there are other inequities that we can see in the workplace. Research says that quite often there's a perception of an in-group at work, those who are on the in, and an out-group, less so. And, you know, when I'm working with leaders, I think it's wise for leaders to have that kind of inner circle. Those most trusted advisors and confidants. But how do you do that in such a way that doesn't create a perception of inequity? It's like, hey, I don't have access to that person. I'm not on the in group. And there are other inequities that we can feel, uh, be it... Uh, based on ethnicity or gender, but we can have a strong perception of an inequity and maybe an, there be an actual inequity. And that leads or builds to a conflict or a potential conflict. Let's look at how we manage, how we navigate, how we deal with conflict. I'm going to throw up from Kilman. We're going to look at their five modes and we won't, we won't, spend an inordinate amount of time on them, but I think it's important for each of us to consider how we deal with conflict. And Kilman would say, hey, you've got a primary mode. Now, let me quickly, and this is really important, situations impact the mode we'll use. I was doing uh, this very training uh, just a few days ago, and someone said, hey, Chuck, is it odd that I'm one way at work and one way at home, and it's not odd at all? In their work role, they have certain expectations, requirements for their role, and they find themselves navigating conflict a little bit differently than when they're at home, and they choose another path. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So you may say, hey, I think I'm this, but in my personal life, I'm probably that. And I'd say that's very, very possible because the, the, for many of us, the mode we would use to deal with conflict will be heavily impacted situationally. Okay, But, you have, but Kilman would say, yeah, you've got a, a, a primary mode. Kilman's assessment has 30 questions, and, and basically there are two decent choices, and you've got to pick one. And you, you pick one, and then at the end, there, you add it up, and there are five choices, and your high score gives you your most common way to navigate conflict, your primary mode. Two dimensions. Um, so imagine on this, on Kilman's model, he's got five possibilities or modes, and the axis or the axes are assertiveness running on the Left-hand side, I think if I remember my geometrical days, that would be the x-axis. Is that right? Is x on the side or is that y? It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Assertiveness 
and it goes from lower to higher. Lower assertiveness to higher assertiveness. And I will demonstrate that with the A. So you'll see either like LA, low assertiveness, or HA, high assertiveness. Or cooperativeness. How, how much do I value the relationship? Assertiveness would be how much more do I value the task or the, the mission, the job at hand. What do I put first? Getting it done, moving forward with whatever that is, or the relationship, the cooperativeness, focus on others' needs. Okay? Focus on my needs and desired outcomes and agenda. You tracking? The, so that bottom axis, which for fun we'll call the Y axis since we don't seem to know, that bottom axis goes from left to right. That's cooperativeness. Assertiveness up the left-hand side, low to high. So there's five modes. The first one is avoiding. It's like, hey, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to engage in that conflict. We have a disagreement. We have a dispute. Going back to our definitions. Now, don't hear conflict as somebody's ready to square off and fight. Okay, it doesn't have to be that. It could be a disagreement ideologically. It can be a, a, uh, a, a resource matter. But we have a conflict. And it's going to be low assertiveness and low cooperation. Like, hey, I'm out. I'm not going to engage in this. I'm out. Withdraw from the situation. You simply don't engage. Okay, you're not going to be part of that. You just step back from it. What does it do? It maintains your neutrality. The relationship is probably in most cases unchanged. I don't think the relationship's going to be better. And, and let's just be real for a minute. You've not helped solve or change the future situation. Whatever it was, you just backed up from it. Like, hey, I'm not going to do that. So imagine, you know, your, your homeowners association is going to vote on something, and you're like, yeah, I don't want any part of that, and you just back up from it. Okay? Understand the sentiment. But the situation, you, won't, you haven't done anything to improve it. You haven't lent your voice to it. You have just backed up from it, and you're just kind of saying, whatever happens, happens. And what may happen, you may not like. It may be worse than the current situation. But the first mode is avoiding. I'm going to avoid that conflict. I'm not going to engage. Second would be competing. Competing. Now, you heard my background. Uh, my first career was in education, teacher, coach, principal. So for those years I was coaching, uh, that's just the essence of competition. And I very much wanted to win. Okay, that was the objective. You know, uh, I did want to make a difference in the players' lives. That was a larger objective. The objective on that particular night it, when the ball went up in the air was to win. And so it was competitive. And there would only be one team, zero sum, that would win. I, we did not tie. I coached basketball. We kept playing. There was no, it was either we win or we lose. That was it. When you compete as a mode of navigating conflict, it is high assertiveness. Think about it. You're competing. You are highly assertive. I wanted my way. I wanted what I wanted. I wanted our team to win. I was not for you. I was not for the other team. There was no concern about what was good for them. I didn't want anything good to happen to them. Okay, I was trying to win, and my interests were mine. And I wasn't thinking about them. High assertiveness, low cooperativeness. 
The other coach could have been a dear friend of mine. In that period of time we were playing, that was not my concern. When the game was over, we were friends again. But during the game, they were trying to win, we were trying to win. Same for this. When people adopt a competitive mode to navigate conflict, they have a very high level of assertiveness. Like, it's about me and what I want. And basically, I'll do what I need to do to get what I want. I am competing. There's a winner and a loser. I need to be the winner. Nobody goes into a competition and says, can't wait, hope we lose. Nobody does that. When we compete at work about an issue of conflict, we are trying to win. Let's not kid ourselves. It's where the goal is win. High assertiveness, low cooperativeness. And it's, it's just that. We're going for it. We want our way. And if they lose, it's, that's fine with me. Now, let me ask you a question. You, you may not have had much experience with losing or not getting your way. But for those of us who occasionally don't get our way, does that usually feel good? When you're in a competition, do you like being on the losing end? I never met that person. No one has ever told me, you know what? I just love losing. Like, no, we don't. We're not wired that way. If it's a competition, and in this instance, at least the other person is competing. They're going for it, and they don't care fully what happens to the other person. The goal is to win. If that's your primary mode, you crinkle the relationships. Because usually the loser is not thrilled about it. It's a zero-sum game. Win, lose. In order for me to win, you have to lose. If you win, I lost, and I don't like that. So when we step into navigating uh, conflict through competition, like we're going at it. The only right answer is my way. They believe the only right answer is their way. And if we stick to that, one of us will win and one of us will lose. Accommodating. Low assertiveness. So remember, assertiveness, that's how much effort and energy I'm putting into getting my way, my agenda. High cooperativeness, the value I place on the relationship. Now I'm going to be accommodating. I'm going to accede to the other party. I'm going to yield. I'm going to give in. Hey, let's do it your way. Let's do it your way. Yeah, that's fine. What, what do we get out of that? I maintain harmony. You got your way. Usually people who get their way are pretty happy about it. Okay, I yield. Now think about the times we use words like that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let's just do it your way. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let's just do it your way. Well, I'm, I've given in. You know, one of the things I notice, we're familiar with the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back. I've noticed that when we use accommodation, that at some point there's often a straw and that straw looks like an overreaction to that issue at hand. Well, it is an overreaction to that moment, but it doesn't count the five or seven or nine or 27 other times I've said, let's just do it your way, it's fine. Let's just do what you want, it's fine. Okay, that's fine, let's just do that. I'm engaged. It's different than withdrawal. I'm, I am, I'm not avoiding it, but I'm yielding. I'm giving in. And at some point, I've noticed that at work and in our personal lives, at some point, the people who have given in, they feel like a lot or consistently or always, at some point, there's a straw. 
And that's when there's like an explosion of emotion usually. A extreme frustration. Like, I've had it. Well, the other person is blown away because they're getting, you know, a pound of reaction for what they probably determined to be an ounce of, of a situation that we've yielded on, we've accommodated. Sure, sure, let's just do it your way. Let's just do it your way. That's fine. Let's do what you want. That's fine. We can do that. That's fine. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Historically, though, I think we often will add those up. And at some point, we're tired of giving in. And it's not that one issue that causes us to react that way. It's the fact that we are, have consistently given in. For some of us, this is our primary style. In fact, the language I've used, you might, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, sure, we'll just do it your way. Sure, just do what you want. Sure, that, that'll work. Let's just do that. And you feel, or people who accommodate often feel like, you know, I'm keeping the peace, maintaining harmony. And in the moment, it is more harmonious. But what often happens is there's going to be a point where one more straw is laid on top of that, and it's like, I've had it. I always give in. We always do what you want. We always. And so I would say, hey, while, again, the situation, you know, your significant other, you wanted to have Mexican for dinner, and they wanted to have seafood. I mean, you just had your taste buds all about nachos. You just couldn't wait tacos and they couldn't wait to have fish and the conversation started with what do you want to eat and you 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 might have said uh, what do you want to eat uh, and then eventually you you proposed a place and they said oh i was really hoping we'd go to here seafood and you say oh okay let's do that that's fine i like that too that's fine and it may have been fine but somewhere back there also might be playing, I always give in. We always go where you want. At work it might be, we always adopt what you propose. We always go with your idea. We always do what you say. And then at some point, there's usually an overreaction to that. So I would say, hey, if accommodation is your go-to, Give that some real thought. Because I don't know if that's the best go-to for, health, for healthy navigation of conflict. Because it's not avoidance, but it's in that same realm as avoidance. Now, when I was doing this, uh, somebody said, Hey, you know, Chuck, whether we ate here or there, I value the person much more than that. It doesn't matter to me, honestly. That was an intentional decision. And what they're saying is, I've thought through this enough that I'm, my intention is not to have that eruption. That I'm not going to feel taken advantage of. That I'm not going to allow myself to tell myself a story where it goes like, I always give in. Why don't they ever give in? They always get their way. Why do they always get their way? Why does, the, why does our boss like them better than they like me? Why don't I? Why don't? Because there's often a narrative that plays when we choose to accommodate. But if you say, hey, I know what I'm doing, and I'm doing it very intentionally, super cool. But I would say, I don't think this is the best long-term or primary mode to navigate conflict. Yes, sir. Question on this comedy is interesting. If you do accommodate in certain situations, is it best served then to clearly define your intention, communicating that to the other individual? Like, that's interesting. I'm like, let's go with that. A lot, you know, so if they understand it's like you agree that accommodation is like an agreement that you are accepting their position and then you're moving forward. So it's building a stronger relationship rather than just kind of, yeah, let's just. I think so. I think so. I think it's even possible to say, you know, I like that. Typically, I might have proposed we do this other. 
to let that person know, hey, I, it's not a given that what you say will do. I've got my own thoughts. I've got my own thinking. My team has its own objectives. And I'm going to make mention of it. Hey, typically, I might have taken a more, more that I might have urged us to be more aggressive. But I, I actually really think in today's climate, that's the best course. Let's do what you've proposed. Now you've said, hey, I'm, I'm, you build that bridge, but you also let them know this isn't a given. Like every time you bring an idea, I'm not going to accede. I'm not going to yield. Great question. The fourth mode is compromising. So the M is for medium. So if you imagine that um, you've got this diagram and on the bottom, the bottom two, you know, it, it's one, two, one in the middle and one, two. The two on the bottom are accommodation and avoidance. Avoidance and accommodation. The one in the middle is compromising. The two at the top are competing and then our last mode. So in compromising, it's just that. This is what many people would say, well, that's what you do when you have a conflict. You look for a middle ground. And hey, there's research to say that at times that is the, the best mode. Medium assertiveness, medium on cooperativeness. It's minimally, minimally acceptable to all, and usually the relationships are undamaged. Okay, so what does that look like? You know, we're in a discussion, and you want this, and I want this other. And there's a gap between us. And you're not going to say, hey, let's just do it your way. Normally I wouldn't propose that, but let's do it your way. And I'm not going to do that either. And we have to come to a place to take a proposal forward. And there's this gap. We're about buying a car. And we've gotten it down to that last thousand dollars. And your budget, you're at the top of your budget. Okay, that's the amount I'm going to spend. And the salesperson's like, hey, I, I got to have that. I can't go any lower. There, we're apart a thousand dollars. And you say, meet me in the middle. Will you meet me in the middle? And they say, yeah, I'll meet you in the middle. You've made a deal. They're $500, according to them, they're $500 in the wrong direction, and you're $500 over your top budget. Now, in the big scheme of finances, is $500 going to wreck either one of you? No. But you're over $500, they're under $500 if all the facts are accurate. And usually when we do that, we, we do something like this. Yeah, I'll meet you in the middle. Yeah, I'll meet you in the middle. Yeah, I'll do that. And, we, and this is kind of how we feel. Yeah. I didn't get all I wanted. They didn't get all they wanted. Now, it might be easy to say we should always look for a compromise. And where I would push back on that, I think sometimes compromise is the best place to be. But it's also not always the best place to be because what if what they were proposing, <laughs> you know, getting into the middle of that still not where we need to be? Like, No. Like, I feel this strongly about this particular situation. I can't compromise. It's not best for the organization. It's not best for the team. I, I'm not going to go there. So compromise is a way to kind of have an undamaged relationship. We probably neither one feel great about it, and neither one of us feels terrible about it. We just walk away and go, eh. You know, we compromised. Now, there are people that I coach that compromise is really not in a, a huge part of their DNA. Like every situation they see is a win-lose. They're a competitor when it comes to conflict, disagreements, seeing things differently. And when you get a, a, a room full, imagine a, a leadership team where there are people wired to compete as their primary mode, then it's like my department against your departments. I can't, and what's best for the whole is less of my concern because I'm about competing for my department. And somebody has to bring order to that. 
Somebody has to bring some resolution to that. Somebody has to call that out. A leader has to call that out and say, hey, I've noticed that, that because if you're on a leadership team, and you're welcome to push back on this, you know, I think your first responsibility is to the greater whole. And your second responsibility is to your individual team. Because if we all go into those meetings always ready for battle for what's best for my team, does the greater whole ever, is the greater whole well served? And I've worked with, with many leadership teams, and some of those teams understand, hey, our first team is the people in this room. And our second team is, the, is our primary area of responsibility. But our first job in this room is to do, determine what's best for the, the course of the organization or team or unit or group. And then we look at each individual component of that. Compromising. Okay, there is certainly a time to compromise. You know, if I really wanted that vehicle, I'd have probably gone 500 more dollars. If they really wanted to sell that vehicle, they'd have probably met me there. Now, I always had the opportunity to walk away in that relationship. Okay, I'm not doing it. Or they could have said, I'm not doing it. I'm not going a penny lower. We could have said that. Or we could compromise. Last one. High on assertiveness. High on cooperativeness. Collaboration. So as you think of that diagram, it'd be the, it'd be the one on the farthest upper right. High on both. It's the only one that's high on both. High on assertiveness. I'm actively engaged. I am, I am sharing my perspectives fully and freely. High on cooperativeness. I value the relationship. I, I, it's not win-lose, it's win-win. It's like, hey, I'm committed to us finding a solution both of us can feel great about. Not live with, feel great about. And I'm in for as long as it takes. And that is the downside of collaboration. It's slower. It's slower. I mean, if, if I'm going to compete, that's pretty quick. Okay, because I'm not, I'm not concerned about you. But now if I need to come up, I'm going to be a part of a discussion that is a win-win. We both, got, we're not leaving till we both win. Or we're not finished till we both can say, I like it. Not I can live with it. I like it. That's an investment. That's an emotional investment. That's a time investment. And that's why I think leaders less frequently go here. Because in this mode of conflict resolution, we are putting all possibilities, and we're both involved in the discussion, well, hey, would this work for you? How would this work? No, we're, or I like that, but if I do that, will, will that give, will that work for you? There's that collaborative environment that says, hey, we, we're, not le we're not finished. Not till we both can live with it, till we both like it. It's good for both of us. Wide range of possible options, and it's a win-win. So I've named five modes. Avoidance, accommodation, compromising, competing, and collaboration. When I named them, you might have recognized, hey, I typically do this. Or I think with this particular situation or person, I've adopted this mode. Kilman would say we all have a primary and we all have secondary, but the situation can cause us to be different. There are situations that would just cause us to take a very different mode because we feel like, for instance, maybe your primary mode is competing. And, you, and in this particular matter, it's like, man, I don't have the energy to deal with that. I don't care. Whatever. Maybe your primary mode is accommodating. 
And on this particular situation, hey, I'm not giving in on this. Like, I'm, I'm not giving in. Five modes to navigate conflict. So what do you think for you primarily determines how you'll deal with direct conflict? What's at stake? Great. And what's at stake may lend itself to how much I care. The person we have conflict with. The person we have conflict with. You know, what is it about them? What's their wiring? What's our history? What position do they have? Hey, let me talk to you for just a minute about position. Because there's a 100%, um, there's a power dynamic in organizational positioning. Like, if you work in an organization that's got a, a few layers, you know your direct supervisor, you know their boss, you know their, your boss's boss, we all know the org chart. And there's a power dynamic. I'll tell you, a dangerous place to be is the primary leader who is a competitor on conflict. Let me say that again. A dangerous place to be is, and this is not the only one, a dangerous place to be is to be the person with the power. Your position gives you that. And your natural tendency is to compete on conflict. So you hear any idea that wasn't yours as a competing idea. And you're wired to compete against conflict. And the danger is you will soon not have very many truth tellers around you. There will be a reluctance. Only the most headstrong and potentially retirement eligible uh, people will seek to go in there and repeatedly say, hey, I don't think we're headed the right direction. When it's not the path the boss has stated they want. Because they're going to compete, they're going to do battle, they have all the power, every... Everything is stacked in their favor. They're going to win. They're going to win. And what happens when a leader establishes an environment where they can't hear other perspectives, soon they won't have to hear other perspectives because people won't bring them to them. And, and I'll just say this with, all great, with the greatest of respect, none of us are smart enough always to not need other perspectives. We all need somebody who's going to say, hey, I don't think we're we got this right. Hey, I don't think where you're headed is the right way. Hey, have you thought about this? Hey, did you know you did this? Now, we also have every right to expect, if you're the primary leader, you have every right to expect that when you make a call, people are going to say, let's go do it. Colin Powell said, hey, when we're debating an issue, I want your unfiltered perspective. Boy, it takes a, a confident leader to create an environment where everybody else can give them their unfiltered, hear that, unfiltered perspective. And then the second part of his statement was, and once we decide a matter, I expect your unwavering commitment to accomplish it. In other words, hey, if we're discussing it, give it to me. I want it. Once we discuss it, though, and I make a call, normally he would be the decision maker. I make the call, now it's about let's go do it. And we can quit talking about should we, if we're doing it. And now it's about all hands on deck, make it happen. But if, you're, if a leader is a competitor on conflict, they hear every contrary idea as competition. They're in a dangerous spot. Another dangerous spot would be a leader whose primary mode is either avoidance or accommodation. Okay, oh, sure. Because then the strongest other voice, and sometimes what, what people tell me is, hey, we know the last one in, when we're thinking about which way to go strategically, the last one in the boss's office, that's the way we're going. Because the boss is going to yield. And if you're the last one in, it was you were the last one. And it was and the decision went in your favor. And I would say just the same, that's not a good place for the leader to be. 
Now, of those two dynamics, the leader always yields, I see that very infrequently. The leader is a competitor, I see that a lot. I see that a lot. So we've all got a natural wiring, which will contribute to our uh, conflict style. We also have situational, including history. We all have those. A little bit on de-escalating conflict. A few thoughts, pause. Hey, like if, if, if things are getting, uh, you know, pretty intense, it, it is a valid solution to say, hey, look, look, hey, look, let's revisit this. I, I'll get on your calendar tomorrow. I'm going to think about it some more. Let's just step back from this a little. And that what you're saying is, hey, we're, we're getting pretty entrenched and this is getting intense. Let's step back from it. Listen actively, active listening. You know, I can't tell if someone's ears are working. You probably can't either. So we, we base how much someone is listening on cues. Those cues are eye contact, head nods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Questions, good questions that demonstrate listening. That's how we determine that. Active listening, be empathetic. Empathy is the ability to consider a matter from somebody else's perspective. We often say... Uh, you know, uh, to walk in their shoes, to imagine what their perspective might be on this, be empathetic, be mindful of tone and body language. I'm not a body language expert, but I've read where, you know, crossed arms seem to indicate a closed off idea. People who point a lot seems to potentially be taken as a hostile act or overly, overly aggressive. Apologize for your contributions to the conflict. It's very possible just to say, and this works. Uh, if it's, if it, you know, if you can say it with with authenticity and you, it's it's true, you mean it. You can say, hey, I got worked up yesterday. I want to apologize for that. You know, I cut you off on that last discussion. I'm sorry about that. I really do want to hear your perspective on this. We need to reach a good path forward. Can we start over? That probably is going to clear the deck and allow for some good, healthy discussion. But you got to be able to mean it. By the way, when you apologize, if you give that apology and then say, but you have no idea what kind of day I'd had, da, 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 it really kind of washes out the rest of it. Like if you can't just give your apology and put a period on it and stop, don't give it. Because it, now I'm wanting to make an excuse. I'm, want, I'm apologizing, sort of, but I mainly want you to know I was justified in what I did because of what I'm about to tell you now. Ask questions to clarify. Find points of agreement. You know, one of the great places to start on a conflict is, hey, I really believe we want this organization, our team, our department, our unit. I believe we both want that to succeed. Am I right in that? Absolutely. So now I find a point of agreement to start and go from there. Okay, we can find typically a point of agreement. It may be a little ways away from where we're going to have to back up to, but we can often find that point of agreement, and that can be pretty powerful. Hey, at the end of the, I believe we're both ultimately wanting the same thing, success for the organization. Is that right? Yes. Okay, we agree on that. Now let's start working towards what we need to get to. Healthy versus unhealthy conflict. You've likely read the book, Five Behaviors of a Cohesive Team by Patrick Lencioni. Lencioni points out, hey, healthy conflict is issue-based. Lencioni would say that on the best teams, there is passionate debate about strategic and ideological perspectives. He would say the best teams aren't the teams that are absent of conflict. Because he would see that as a lack of investment and avoidance. And, you know, just tell me what you want. That's not the language of the best teams. The best teams are, hey, I've got an idea. Hey, I've got an idea. Okay, well, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. 
And Lencioni would say, hey, that is the makings of an outstanding team because people care, they're invested, they come with ideas, and occasionally those ideas and those people bump into each other. And when they bump into each other, what do they do then? And he says, healthy conflict is idea-based. It is, it is people offering differing strategic perspectives. Hey, I think we should roll that product out first quarter of 2024. I don't think that's the best time. Let's wait for the spring. Let's do that in, in quarter two. Here's why. Here's why. Unhealthy conflict becomes personal. Is it possible for people who are less effective at navigating differing opinions to hear a, a counter perspective personally and think that's a personal attack and now I've moved from healthy conflict to unhealthy conflict? Absolutely. Healthy conflict is issue-based. Unhealthy conflict is personal in nature. That's so typical of you, Chuck. You always do that. Now they're attacking me. Okay? When an individual's attacked, most of the time we respond either defensively or offensively. Healthy conflict issues, unhealthy conflict personal. Now let's talk about you are leading the, the meeting, leading the team, and unhealthy conflict occurs. Now, first of all, let me pull up to 10,000 feet. If, you, if it's your meeting, you're in charge of that gathering. If you're the most senior person in the room, you're in charge of that situation. If you're the team leader, it's your team. And, and I, I'll probably move through these faster than you can get them. Be easy for you, if you just sent me an email, and I put my contact up. Hey, can I have the slides? I'll be glad to send them to you. Don't worry about it. Okay? Unhealthy conflict is happening. What do you do? Let me give you Chuck's very non-scientific observation. My observation is of 100% of, of the problems, 98% don't fix themselves. By, don't fix themselves. 98% of them require a leader somebody to step into it. Occasionally, that underperformer who is driving you crazy and you've been dreading having this conversation, they walk into your office the day before you've kind of come to the resolution, I've got to have this conversation. They walk in and they say, hey, I need to give you my notice. We're moving to Oregon. And you let them get out of your office and then you go, yes, awesome. That's great news because now you don't have to deal with it. But my experience is 98% of the issues we have to deal with. That's a very unscientific accounting. What do you do when you see unhealthy conflict? Intervene early. Okay, let me set that stage for you. Let me see how we're doing on time. Great. I'm almost finished and our time's about up. It's perfect. Here's the setting. You've got a really strong personality on your team or in one of the meetings that you regularly chair. And... You've got other personalities in the room who aren't as outwardly strong. They're not as opinionated outwardly. They're not as, as loud. They're not as passionate. And this loud personality regularly stifles the others. It's your meeting. What are you going to do about that? You say, well, these are all grown-ups. Let them handle their issue. It's your meeting. This is Chuck's perspective. But I would be urging you to say, hey, it's your meeting, and that's unhealthy. And this is where I think you have to do a little bit of referee. And I would perhaps start, but if this was, hey, we're going to have a project team, and we're going to meet every Monday at 1 o'clock. And before we got started, a best practice would have been, hey, let me lay the groundwork, kind of the ground rules for our meeting together. We're going to meet for the next probably 18 months, once a week, and get a project update. And I'm sure during that time we're going to bump into each other, we're going to have differing opinions. Let me set the ground rules, because ultimately we all want the same thing, right? We all want this project to be successful. Am I right? Everybody's head would nod. Then let's agree to operate under these simple rules, whatever they might be. Hey, one person talks at a time. If you have a disagreement, keep it topic-based, not personal. You come up with three rules. Okay, if you miss, send a delegate or not. Whatever your rules are. But you've established some culture around that meeting that's going to keep happening. But let's say you didn't do that. It's not typically done. Let's say that you didn't do that. 
and you see this stronger personality running over a, a different personality type. Just steamrolling them. Now, do you let that go? Because that, in all probability, one two things going to happen. Either that that person who got steamrolled is going to even be less engaged in the meetings. Okay, I don't want that to happen again. That was uncomfortable. Or they're going to just withdraw even more. Maybe stop coming to the meetings. We've empowered the steamroller because they got what they wanted. We basically said, hey, do that again. That worked. Run over the top anybody you want to. What are we going to do about it? I would propose, depending on your relationship with the steamroller, whether you, you have the, you call a foul on the mo at the moment, ho hold up. Hey, let's, let's keep our disagreements on topic. Chuck, you were saying something. Would you continue? Now, you don't have to do that a whole lot before you've established, hey, we're not doing that in here. Like, everybody around this table has value, and I'm not going to let you steamroll somebody. But I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to shoot straight with you. Most leaders I see don't do that. They just let that steamroller roll, and they roll. They dominate the meetings. They talk a lot. No one else really has room to get their voice out. And we could say, hey, if somebody else wants to step up, we're all not wired the same. The very best idea could be from that very quiet person sitting over there waiting to be treated with a little bit, little bit more respect. They might have the best idea. We're never going to hear it because they don't want to get run over, especially in front of their peers. So what are you going to do about it? It's your meeting. I urge you to intervene early. Stop damaging behaviors. If you have some team or cultural, cultural expectations, review them. If you don't have some, get some. What is acceptable on our team? Hey, this is what I want us to be known for. I want us to be a genuine team. What does that look like? We're going to work together. We're going to occasionally disagree. We're going to debate. But we're going to fight civilly. And here's what I mean by that. We're going to disagree about issues. We're not going to disagree about people. Uh, whatever, however you would say it. Get to the root cause. You may have to have some one-on-one -on -one meetings. You might have to bring both the steamroller and the other person in. Now, when you've got two steamrollers, you're going to be forced to do something. Because they're going to power up and power up and power up and power up and power up, and there will be no avoiding that one. The one we don't usually handle is the steamroller and the person who, who just yields. Get to the areas of agreement. Get commitments. Hey, this is, this is really important. We're going to be together on this project for the next year. We're going to meet once a week. I want these meetings to be productive, and I, I want them to be, to be inclusive of everyone. Do I have your commitment going forward to what we discussed today? It's either yes or no. But if you get their commitment, then you know what you get to do when they step out a little bit? You get to have that private meeting and say, hey, don't forget that commitment you made. Today got out of bounds again. But you got to be willing to step into that. Awesome. Questions? Questions? Well, well, yes, please. please. Uh, hey. How do you, as a leader, a leader address those that steamroll? What would be the best way to kind of coach them or make them aware that they do it? Well, I would take into account my relationship with them. In other words, sometimes I've got a great relationship, there's an easy rapport, and sometimes it's more formal or stiff or very constrained to our positions. That would determine my language more than anything else. But ultimately, I would have that meeting one-on-one, -on -one, taking into account, you know, uh, time and place. I wouldn't have it on Friday afternoon or Monday morning. I'd have it in a safe environment where they didn't feel like they were on display. But then I'd just call it out. I wouldn't beat around the bush. And I would start with my observation. Hey, I, I've observed in our meeting that you can be forceful. 
And here's some examples that I, I, I'll point to. You know, in this situation, you just kept getting louder. You talked over the top of, well, you talked over me and you talked over so-and-so. In this situation, you did this. I'd, I'd have about three good examples that would be irrefutable. And they will likely say, that's the way I am. To which, I respond something along the lines of, hey, I get that. But in this meeting, we're going to work together. I don't, it's not an excuse. I'd, I'd urge you to have the conversation. If you have this conversation, you're in a very small group of leaders, in my experience, who step into those situations. You'll make everybody on your team, you'll give everybody, including the steamroller, a better environment. Part of this is you coaching the steamroller to gain other skills other than just increasing their passion and volume when it's something they want. It's a great question. And I'm cheering for you from a distance to have that conversation. Just uh, words from one of my mentors years ago that I never forget and I use quite frequently with different situations and the three words help me understand yeah awesome and if i use that in help me understand i saw you do that help me understand it puts the it lowers that that bar and they're like feel at ease to really communicate effectively you got to really listen during that time frame because they're really you're asking them to really just pour it out so even in a very difficult situation that i've encountered in my past i've used that and filled in the blank, and it's like deeper, David Copperfield, magical. <laughs> I swear, it's like they walked out on what the heck just happened, and so did I. I mean, it's like it's really a powerful, powerful thing. So help me understand. So yeah, yeah. I share that because he's passed it on. I passed it on my managers in the past, and it's it's really a good, good tool. It's fantastic. Actually, if you're, if you're taking notes today, jot down somewhere, help me understand. It's a great question. Hey, help me understand what's happening here. Help me understand what's going on. And I think the tone you ask that question is important. Because I can put them on the defensive with a different tone as opposed to an inquisitive tone. A hand? Yeah. I think it was the 11th commandment. <laughs> Absolutely. Do they work for you? No. Okay. So you can't. So what I'm in my, the limited context I have, you don't have the authority to require a certain change in performance. So, but you could be colleagues. Maybe you're working in a, in a cross disciplinary situation. I, I would have a one to one conversation first. Hey. Chuck, can I, can I talk to you about something? Hey, this is due, and we've still not gotten yours. And when that happens, that puts all of us behind. And I'm just going to ask that you keep up with your, your part of the responsibilities. And if they say, who are you to ask of that? Okay. But I didn't go to their boss first. Or I didn't go to my boss first. I went to them. But if they give me that kind of answer and ultimately, hey, they're not doing their part and it's not okay, their boss should be dealing with that, by the way, but let's say, for whatever reason that they haven't, then I'd start moving on and I'd go to my own boss. Say, here's the situation, here's what I've done. Because if I were your boss, I might say, have you talked to them? So you go ahead and knock that out so you can say, I did. It didn't go well. Or I did, they made a commitment, they've not kept it up, I'm, I need to go to the next step. That's a great question. Thank you. Y'all's questions are awesome. I, I want to be respectful of our time. We've got three minutes and I've got a three minute challenge. I'm going to tell you a story about my friend Pat Summit. This is the challenge. So, um, in, in a limited time, 
I coached high school boys basketball, Pat coached college women. 30-some years ago, my path crossed with Pat. I worked her camp. It's a long story, but I was there. She and I connected over the fact we both love coaching. We both just love coaching. Now, take into account, Pat, in professional acclaim, not worth of a human, but Pat, in professional acclaim, was somewhere higher up that chart than Chuck. Pat, Chuck. I'm not talking about humanity. I'm not talking about my worth as a person. I'm talking about Pat and Chuck as coaches and what she had accomplished. Yet she connected with me. Pat was really that initiator, I'm wondering. Do we have somebody who you're above that you would say, hey, I'm going to lend a hand to that person? So through the years, Pat and I, we had a friendship. You know, we, we were friends, and I don't want to oversell it in her passing. We didn't run around together. We didn't hang out together. But we had that common link as coaches. Even when I got out of coaching, we were friends. Here's the lesson. One day I was in my office at Oak Ridge High School where I was a boys basketball coach and the phone rings. Spring of the year, great time to be a basketball coach. You play the games in the winter. You're undefeated in your mind. <laughs> so the phone rings and it was Pat. Now this was in an era I can still see that beige little desk phone on my little desk in the gym. Many of you never even knew there were such things, but, but there were. And I answered and it was Pat. She said, Chuck, I'm getting a group of coaches together tomorrow at my office. I want to learn something about the motion offense, and I've heard you've run it. Can you come over tomorrow and help me? Now, let me pause here a minute and say, I've got two children, and I'm so glad neither were born the next day because that would have been a hard decision. <laughs> Pat didn't call me all that often and say, will you come over? Here's the lesson. About three months before I had received that phone call, I'd watched the Lady Vols win one of their national championships, and Pat was the head coach. Like many, I, on ESPN... I'd watch that game like many East Tennesseans and sports fans across the world. And as traditional in college basketball, I'd watched each player take their turn with a pair of scissors, take a strand of net that they would cherish for the rest of their life. It would be a treasured memento. And then the assistant coaches and then the managers. And last, with one strand hanging, the head coach goes up that little ladder with that little pair of scissors and snips that last strand signifying we're the national champions. Pat would get to keep that net as a memento of that accomplishment. See, the person who called me that day wasn't just my friend. The person who called me that day at that time was the head coach of the national champions. Anybody who did what she did for a living would say, can I swap places with you? Here's the lesson. No matter how much Pat achieved, she never stopped desiring to learn, grow, and improve a little bit more. She never got full of her accomplishments. She stayed hungry to get a little bit better. Let it be said of us that we never stopped learning, growing, and improving. Today's been a treat for me. I wish you the very best. Thank you.